The Exchange by John Grisham Chapter 1 On the 48th floor of a glistening tower on the southern tip of Manhattan, Mitch McDeer stood alone in his office and gazed out the window at Battery Park and the busy waters beyond. Boats of all shapes and sizes crisscrossed the harbor. Massive cargo ships laden with containers waited almost motionless. The Staten Island Ferry inched past Ellis Island. A cruise ship packed with tourists headed out to sea. A mega yacht was making a splendid entrance into the city. A brave soul on a 15-foot catamaran zigzagged about, dodging everything. A thousand feet above the water, no fewer than five helicopters buzzed about like angry hornets. In the far distance, trucks on the Verrazano Bridge stood still, bumper to bumper. Lady Liberty watched it all from her majestic perch. It was a spectacular view that Mitch tried to appreciate at least once each day. Occasionally he succeeded, but most days were too hectic to allow time for such loafing. He was on the clock. His life was ruled by it, just like the hundreds of other lawyers in the building. Scully Pershing had over 2,000 scattered around the world and vainly considered itself to be the premier international firm on the planet. Its New York partners and Mitch was one, rewarded themselves with larger offices in the heart of the financial district. The firm was now a hundred years old and reeked of prestige, power, and money. He glanced at his watch and the sightseeing came to an end. A pair of associates knocked and entered for another meeting. They met around a small table as the secretary offered coffee. They declined and she left. Their client was a Finnish shipping company having problems in South Africa. The authorities there had embargoed a freighter packed with electronics from Taiwan. Empty, the ship was worth about a hundred million. Fully loaded, it was worth twice that. And the South Africans were upset over some tariff issues. Mitch had been to Cape Town twice in the past year and was not keen to return. After half an hour, he dismissed the associates with a list of instructions and welcomed another pair. At 5 p.m. sharp, he checked in with his secretary, who was leaving, and walked past the elevators to the stairs. For short rides up and down, he avoided the elevators to escape the mindless chit-chat of lawyers he knew and didn't know. He had many friends in the firm and only a handful of known enemies. And there was always a new wave of fresh associates and eager junior partners with faces and names he was supposed to recognize. Often he did not. Nor did he have time to pore over the firm directory and try to memorize them. So many would be gone before he knew their names. Taking the stairs, worked his legs and lungs, and always reminded him that he was no longer in college, no longer playing football and intramural basketball, and able to do so for hours. He was 41 and still in decent shape because he watched his diet and skipped lunch at least three times a week while he worked out in the firm's gym. Another perk for partners only. He left the stairwell on the 42nd floor and hustled to the office of Willie Backstrom, another partner but one with the luxury of not billing by the hour. Willie had the enviable position of running the firm's pro bono programs, and though he kept up with his hours, he did not send bills. There was no one to pay them. The lawyers at Scully made plenty of money, especially the partners, and the firm was notorious for its commitment to pro bono work. It volunteered for difficult cases around the world. Every lawyer was required to donate at least 10% of his or her time to various causes, all approved by Willie. There was an even split down the middle of the firm on the issue of pro bono work. Half the lawyers enjoyed it because it was a welcome break from the stressful grind of representing high-pressure corporate clients. For a few hours a month, a lawyer could represent a real person or a struggling nonprofit and not worry about sending bills and getting paid. The other half paid lip service to the lofty notion of giving back but considered it wasteful. Those 250 hours a year could be better spent making money and improving one's standing with the various committees that determined who got promoted, who made partner, and who eventually got the boot. 
Willie Backstrom kept the peace, which wasn't really that difficult because no lawyer, regardless of his or her ambition, would ever criticize the firm's aggressive pro bono programs. Scully even gave annual awards to its lawyers who went beyond the call of duty in service to the less fortunate. Mitch was currently spending four hours a week working with a homeless shelter in the Bronx and representing clients who were fighting evictions. It was safe, clean office work, which was just what he wanted. Seven months earlier, he had watched a death row client in Alabama utter his last words before being executed. He'd spent 800 hours over six years trying in vain to save the guy, and watching him die was heartbreaking. The ultimate failure. Mitch wasn't sure what Willie wanted, but the fact that he'd been called in was an ominous sign. Willie was the only lawyer at Scully with a ponytail, and a bad one at that. It was gray and matched his beard, and just a few years before someone higher up would have told him to shave and get a haircut. But the firm was working hard to shed its fossilized image as a white-collar club filled with white men in dark suits. One of its radical changes was the ditching of a dress code. Willie grew hair and whiskers and went about his work in jeans. Mitch, still in a dark suit but with no tie, sat across the desk as they went through the small talk. Willie finally got around to it with, say, Mitch. There's a case down south I want you to take a look at. Please don't tell me the guy is on death row. The guy is on death row. I can't do it, Willie. Please. I've had two of those in the past five years and both got the needle. My track record is not very good. You did great work, Mitch. No one could have saved those two. I can't take another one. Will you at least listen? Mitch conceded and shrugged. Willie's fondness for death row cases was legendary and few lawyers at Scully could say no to him. Okay, I'll listen. His name is Tad Kearney and he's got 90 days. A month ago he made the strange decision to fire his lawyers, all of them, and he had quite a team. Sounds crazy. Oh, he is. Off the charts crazy, probably legally insane, but Tennessee is pushing hard nonetheless. Ten years ago, he shot and killed three undercover narcotics officers in a drug bust that went haywire. Bodies everywhere. Total of five died at the scene. Tad almost died, but they managed to save him so they could execute him later. Mitch laughed in frustration and said, And supposed to ride in on a white horse and save the guy. Come on, Willie. Give me something to work with. There's virtually nothing to work with except insanity. The problem is that he probably won't agree to see you. Then why bother? Because we have to try, Mitch. And I think you're our best bet. I'm still listening. Well, he reminds me a lot of you. Gee, thanks. No, seriously. He's white your age and from Dane County, Kentucky. For a second, Mitch couldn't respond, then managed to say, great. We're probably cousins. I don't think so, but his father worked in the coal mines, same as yours, and both died there. My family is off limits. Sorry. You caught a lucky break and had the brains to get out. Tad did not and before long was involved with drugs both as a user and a dealer. He and some pals were making a big delivery near Memphis when they were ambushed by narcotics officers. Everybody died but Tad. Looks like his luck has finally run out. No question about his guilt. Certainly not for the jury. The issue is not guilt, but insanity. The idea is to have him evaluated by some specialists, our doctors, and file a last-minute Hail Mary. First, though, someone has to go in and talk to the man. Right now, he's not accepting visitors. And you think we'll bond? It's a long shot, but why not give it a try? Mitch took a deep breath and tried to think of another way out. 
To pass the time, he asked, who's got the case? Well, technically no one. Tad has become quite the jailhouse lawyer, and he filed the necessary papers to terminate his attorneys. Amos Patrick represented him for a long time, one of the best down there. You know Amos? I met him once at a conference. Quite the character. Most death row lawyers are real characters. Look, Willie, I have no desire to become known as a death row lawyer. I've been there twice, and that's enough. These cases eat at you and become all-consuming. How many of your clients have you watched die? Willie closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Mitch whispered, Sorry. Too many, Mitch. Let's just say I've been there. Look, I've talked to Amos and talked and talked, and he likes the idea. He'll drive you to the prison, and who knows, maybe Tad will find you interesting enough to have a chat. Sounds like a dead end. In ninety days, it will certainly be a dead end, but at least we will have tried. Mitch stood and walked to a window. Willie's view was westward over the Hudson. Amos is in Memphis, right? Yes. I really don't want to go back to Memphis. Too much history. Ancient history, Mitch. Fifteen years ago, you picked the wrong firm and had to leave. Had to leave. Hell, they were trying to kill me down there. People were dying, Willie, and the whole firm went to prison. Along with their clients. They all deserved prison, didn't they? I suppose, but I got the blame. And they're all gone now, Mitch. Scattered. Mitch returned to his chair and smiled at his friend. Just curious, Willie. Do people around here talk about me and what happened in Memphis? No, it's never mentioned. We know the story, but no one has the time to gossip about it. You did the right thing, got away, and started over. You're one of our stars, Mitch, and that's all that matters at Scully. I don't want to go back to Memphis. You need the hours. You're kind of light this year. I'll catch up. Why can't you find me some nice little foundation in need of pro bono counsel? Maybe an outfit that feeds hungry kids or delivers clean water to Haiti. You'd be miserable. You prefer action. Trauma, the ticking clock. Been there, done that. Please, I'm asking for a favor. There's really no one else. And there's an excellent chance you won't get in the prison door. I really don't want to go back to Memphis. Man up. There's a direct flight tomorrow at 1.30 out of LaGuardia. Amos is expecting you. If nothing else, you'll enjoy his company. Mitch smiled in defeat. As he stood, he mumbled, Okay, okay, and headed to the door. You know, I think I do remember some Kearneys in Dane County. Atta boy. Go visit Tad. You're right. He might be a distant cousin. Not distant enough. Chapter 2 Most Scully partners, along with many of their rivals in big law, as well as countless money runners on Wall Street, scurried from the tall buildings around 6 p.m. and hopped into black sedans driven by professionals. The more important hedge fund stars sat in the spacious rear seats of long European cars they actually owned and were driven by chauffeurs on their payroll. The truly essential masters of the universe had fled the city altogether and lived and worked quietly in Connecticut. Though he could afford a car service, Mitch took the subway, one of his many concessions to frugality and his humble past. He caught the 610 train at South Ferry, found a seat on a crowded bench, and, as always, buried his face behind a newspaper. Eye contact was to be avoided. The car was packed with other well-heeled professionals headed north, none of whom had any interest in chatting. There was nothing wrong with riding the subway. 
It was quick, easy, cheap, and for the most part safe. The rub was that the other passengers were, in some fashion, Wall Streeters, and as such were either making plenty of money or on the verge of it. Private sedans were almost within reach. Their subway days were almost over. Mitch had no time for such nonsense. He flipped through the newspaper, patiently squeezed even closer to other passengers, as the car took on more riders and allowed his mind to drift away to Memphis. He had never said he would never return. Between him and Abby, that promise did not have to be expressed. Getting away from the place had been so frightening that they could not imagine going back for any reason. However, the more he thought about it, the more intrigued he became. It was a quick trip that would probably lead nowhere. He was doing Willie a huge favor, one that would undoubtedly lead to a nice payback. After 22 minutes, he emerged from underground at the Columbus Circle Station and began the daily walk to his apartment. It was a splendid April evening, with pleasant skies and temperature, one of those postcard moments when half the city's population seemed to be outdoors. Mitch, though, hurried home. Their building was on 69th Street at Columbus Avenue, in the heart of the Upper West Side. Mitch spoke to the doorman, collected the daily mail, and rode the elevator to the 14th floor. Clark opened the door and reached up for a hug. At the age of eight, he was still a little boy and unashamed to show his father some affection. Carter, his twin, was slightly more mature and already outgrowing the rituals of physical contact with his father. Mitch would have hugged and kissed Abby and asked about her day, but she had guests in the kitchen. A delicious aroma filled the apartment. Some serious food was being prepared and dinner would be another delight. The chefs were the Rosario brothers, Marco and Marcello, also twins. They were from a small village in Lombardia in northern Italy, and two years earlier had opened a trattoria near Lincoln Center. It was a hit from day one and was soon awarded two stars by the Times. Reservations were hard to get. The current waiting time was four months for a table. Mitch and Abby had discovered the place and ate there often, any time they wanted. Abby had the clout to get a table because she was editing the Rosario's first cookbook. She also encouraged them to use her modern kitchen to experiment with new recipes, and at least once a week they descended upon the McDeer apartment with bags of ingredients and a near riotous approach to cooking. Abby was right in the middle of it, rattling away in perfect Italian as Carter and Clark watched from the safety of their stools near a counter. Marco and Marcello loved performing for the kids and explained their preparations in thickly accented English. They also chided the boys into repeating Italian words and phrases. Mitch chuckled at the scene as he tossed his briefcase, took off his jacket, and poured a glass of Chianti. He asked the boys about their homework and received the standard assurances that it was all finished. Marco presented a small platter of bruschetta, placed it on the counter in front of the boys, and informed Mitch that he should not worry about homework and such because the boys were doing important work as taste testers. Mitch pretended to be sufficiently chastised. He would check the homework later. The name of their restaurant was, not surprisingly, Rosario's, and it was embroidered in bold letters across red aprons worn by the chefs. Marcello offered one to Mitch, who, as always, declined on the grounds that he could not cook. When they were alone in the kitchen, Abby allowed him to peel and chop vegetables, measure spices under her watchful eye, set the table, and handle the garbage. All grunt work she deemed acceptable for his talents. He had once elevated himself to the position of sous-chef, but was rather harshly demoted when he burned a baguette. She asked for a small glass of wine. Marco and Marcello declined, as usual. Mitch had learned years earlier that Italians, in spite of their prodigious production of wine and the presence of it at virtually every meal, actually drank little. A carafe of their favorite local red or white would satisfy a large family over a long dinner. Due to her knowledge of Italian food and wine, 
Abby was a senior editor at Epicurean, a small but busy press in the city. The company specialized in cookbooks and published about 50 of them a year, almost all of them thick, handsome editions loaded with recipes from around the world. Because she knew many chefs and restaurant owners, she and Mitch dined out often and seldom bothered with reservations. Their apartment was a favorite laboratory for young chefs, dreaming of success in a city crowded with fine restaurants and serious gourmands. Most of the meals prepared there were extraordinary, but since the chefs were free to experiment, there was the occasional dude. Carter and Clark were easy guinea pigs and were being raised in a world of cutting-edge recipes. If the chefs couldn't please them, their dishes were probably in trouble. The boys were encouraged to pan any dish they didn't like. Their parents often joked quietly about raising a couple of food snobs. Tonight there would be no complaints. The bruschetta was followed by a small truffle pizza. Abby announced that the appetizers were over and directed her family to the dining table. Marco served the first course, a spiced fish soup called caxioco, as Marcello found a seat. All six took a small bite, savored the flavors, and thought about their reactions. It was slow eating, and this often bothered the kids. The pasta course was capoletti, small ravioli in beef broth. Carter, in particular, loved pasta and declared it delicious. Abby wasn't so sure. Marco served a second pasta course of risotto with saffron. Since they were conducting research in a lab, a third pasta course of spaghetti and clam sauce was next. The servings were small, only a few bites, and they joked about pacing themselves. The Rosarios bickered back and forth about the ingredients, the variations of the recipes, and so on. Mitch and Abby offered their own opinions, often with the adults all talking at the same time. After the fish course, the boys were getting bored. They were soon excused from the table and went upstairs to watch television. They missed the meat course, braised rabbit, and the dessert of panforte, a dense chocolate cake with almonds. Over coffee, the McDeers and Rosarios debated which recipes should be included in the cookbook and which needed more work. It was months away from completion, so there were many dinners to follow. Shortly after eight, the brothers were ready to pack up and leave. They needed to hustle back to their restaurant and check on the crowd. After a quick clean-up and the usual round of hugs, they left with serious promises to return next week. When the apartment was quiet, Mitch and Abby returned to the kitchen. As always, it was still a mess. They finished loading the dishwasher, stacked some pots and pans by the sink, and turned off the light. The housekeeper would be there in the morning. With the boys tucked in, they retired to the study for a nightcap, a glass of Barolo. They replayed the dinner, talked about work, and unwound. Mitch couldn't wait to deliver the news. I'll be out of town tomorrow night, he said. It was nothing new. He was often gone ten nights a month, and she had accepted the demands of his job a long time ago. It's not on the calendar, she said with a shrug. Clocks and calendars ruled their lives, and they were diligent with their planning. Somewhere fun, Memphis. She nodded, trying and failing to hide her surprise. Okay, I'm listening, and this better be good. He smiled and gave her a quick summary of his conversation with Willie Backstrom. Please, Mitch, not another death row case. You promised. I know, I know, but I couldn't say no to Willie. It's a desperate situation, and it's probably a wasted trip. I said I would try. I thought we were never going back there. So did I. But it's only for 24 hours. She took a sip of her wine and closed her eyes. When they reopened, she said, We haven't talked about Memphis in a long time, have we? No, no need to, really. But it's been 15 years, and everything has changed. I still don't like it. I'll be fine.
Abby. No one will recognize me. All the bad guys are gone. You hope. As I recall, Mitch, we left town in the middle of the night, scared to death, certain the bad guys were after us. And they were. But they're gone. Some are dead. The firm imploded and everybody went to prison. Where they belonged. Yes, but there's not a single member of the firm still in Memphis. I'll ease in and out and no one will know. I don't like the memories of the place. Look, Abby, we made the decision a long time ago to live normal lives without looking over our shoulders. What happened there is old history now. But if you take the case, your name will be on the news, right? If I take the case, which looks doubtful, I won't hang out in Memphis. The prison is in Nashville. Then why are you going to Memphis? Because the lawyer, or ex-lawyer, works there. I'll visit him in his office, get briefed, then we'll make the drive to the prison. Scully has about a million lawyers. Surely they can find someone else. There's not much time. If the client refuses to see me, then I'm off the hook and back home before you even miss me. Who says, I'll miss you? You're gone all the time. Yes, and I know you're miserable when I'm out of town. We can hardly survive. She smiled, shook her head, and reminded herself that arguing with Mitch was a waste of time. Please be careful. I promise. Chapter 3 the first time Mitch had stepped into the ornate lobby of the Peabody Hotel in downtown Memphis, he was two months shy of his 25th birthday. He was a third-year student at Harvard Law and would graduate the following spring number four in his class. In his pocket, he had three splendid job offers from mega firms, two in New York and one in Chicago. None of his friends could understand why he would waste a trip to visit a firm in Memphis, which was not exactly in the major leagues of big law. Abby was also skeptical. He'd been driven by greed. Though the Bandini firm was small, only 40 lawyers, it was offering more money and perks and a faster track to a partnership. But he had rationalized the greed, even managed to deny it, and convinced himself that a small-town kid would feel more at home in a smaller city. The firm had a family feel to it, and no one ever left. Not alive, anyway. He should have known that an offer too good to be true came with serious strings and baggage. He and Abby lasted only seven months and were lucky to escape. Back then, they had walked through the lobby holding hands and gawking at the rich furnishings, oriental rugs, art, and the fabulous fountain in the center with ducks swimming in circles. They were still swimming and he wondered if they were the same ducks. He got a diet soda at the bar and fell into a thick chair near the fountain. The memories came in a torrent. The giddiness of being heavily recruited, the relief that law school was almost over, the unbounded certainty of a bright future. A new career, new home, fancy car, fat salary. He and Abby had even talked of starting a family. Sure, he'd had some doubts, but they had begun to dissipate the moment he entered the Peabody. How could he have been so foolish? Had it really been fifteen years? They were just kids back then, and so naive. He finished his drink and walked to the desk to check in. He had reserved a room for one night in the name of Mitchell I. McDear, and as he waited for the receptionist to find his reservation, he had the fleeting thought that someone might remember him. The receptionist did not, nor would anyone else. Too much time had passed, and the conspirators who'd chased him were long gone. He went to his room, changed into jeans, and left the hotel for a walk. Three blocks away, on Front Street, he stood and stared at a five-story edifice once known as the Bendini Building. He almost shuddered at the memories of his brief but complicated time there. He recalled names and saw old faces, all of them gone now, 
either dead or living quiet lives elsewhere. The building had been renovated, renamed, and was now packed with condos advertising views of the river. He walked on and found Lansky's Dealey, an old Memphis tradition that had not changed. He went in, took a seat on a stool at the counter, and asked for coffee. To his right was a row of booths, all empty in the late afternoon. The third one was exactly where he'd been sitting when an FBI agent appeared out of nowhere and began quizzing him about his firm. It had been the beginning of the end, the first clear signal that things were not as they seemed. Mitch closed his eyes and replayed the entire conversation word for word. Wayne Terrence was the agent's name, one he would never forget regardless of how hard he tried. When the coffee was gone, he paid for it and left and walked to Main Street where he caught a trolley for a short ride. Some of the buildings were different, some looked the same. Many of them reminded him of events he had struggled to erase from his mind. He got off at a park, found a seat on a bench under a tree, and called the office to see what chaos he was missing. He called Abby and checked on the boys. All was well at home. No, he was not being followed. No one remembered him. At dusk, he wandered back to the Peabody and took the elevator to the top. The bar on the roof was a popular spot to watch the sunset over the river and have drinks with friends, usually on Friday afternoon after a hard week. During his first visit, his recruiting trip, he and Abby had been entertained there by younger members of the firm and their spouses. Everyone had a spouse. All the lawyers were men. Those were the unwritten rules at Bendini back then. Later, when they were alone, they had a quiet drink on the roof and made the calamitous decision to take the job. He got a beer, leaned on a railing, and watched the Mississippi River wind its way past Memphis on its eternal voyage to New Orleans. Massive barges loaded with soybeans inched along under the bridge to Arkansas as the sun finally set beyond the endless flat farm fields. Nostalgia failed him. The days of such promise had vanished within weeks as their lives became an unbelievable nightmare. There was only one choice for dinner. He crossed Union Avenue, entered an alley and could smell the ribs. The rendezvous was by far the most famous restaurant in town, and he had eaten there many times, as often as possible. On occasion, Abby had met him after work for their famous dry-smoked ribs and ice-cold beer. It was Tuesday, and though always busy, it was nothing like the weekends when it was not unusual to wait an hour for a table. Reservations were out of the question. A waiter pointed to a table in one of the many cramped dining rooms, and Mitch took a seat with a view of the main bar. Menus were unnecessary. Another waiter walked by and asked, Do you know what you want? A full order, small cheese plate, tall beer. The waiter never stopped walking. He had noticed many changes in the city, but there would always be one constant. The rendezvous would always be the same. The walls were plastered with photos of famous guests, Liberty Bowl programs, neon signs for beer and soft drinks, sketches of old Memphis, and more photos, many from decades earlier. One tradition was to tack a business card to the wall before leaving, and there must have been a million of them. He had done so himself and wondered if there were any left from the lawyers at Bendini, Lambert Locke. Since it was evident that no one ever bothered to remove a card, he suspected they were still there. Ten minutes later, the waiter presented a platter of ribs, cheddar cheese, and a side of slaw. The beer was as cold as he remembered. He ripped off a rib, took a large bite, savored it, and had his first pleasant memory of Memphis. The Capital Defense Initiative was founded by Amos Patrick in 1976, soon after the Supreme Court lifted the ban on capital punishment. When that happened, the death states scrambled to spruce up their electric chairs and gas chambers, and the race was on. They were still trying to outkill one another. Texas was the clear leader, with several states jockeying for second place. 
Amos grew up dirt poor in rural Georgia and had known hunger as a child. His close friends were all black, and as a small kid he was angered by their mistreatment. As a teenager, he began to understand racism and its insidious effects on black people. Though he didn't understand the word liberal, he grew up to become quite a radical. A high school biology teacher recognized his aptitude and steered him to college. Otherwise, he would have spent his life working the peanut fields with his friends. Amos was a legend in the confined world of death penalty defense. For 30 years, he had waged war on behalf of cold-blooded killers who were guilty of crimes that often defied description. To survive, he had learned to take the crimes, put them in a box, and ignore them. The issue wasn't guilt. The issue was giving the state, with its flaws, prejudices, and power to screw things up, the right to kill. And he was tired. The work had finally beaten him down. He had saved many lives, lost his share along the way, and in doing so built a non-profit that attracted enough money to sustain itself and enough talent to keep up the fight. His fight was fading fast, though, and his wife and doctor were badgering him to slow down. His office was legendary, too. It was a bad imitation of 1930s Art Deco that had been expanded and whittled down over the decades. A car dealer built it, and once sold new and used Pontiacs along Auto Row on Summer Avenue, six miles from the river. With time, though, the dealerships moved on, fled farther east like most of Memphis, and left behind boarded showrooms, many of which were bulldozed. Amos saved the Pontiac place at an auction that attracted no one but him. His mortgage was guaranteed by some sympathetic lawyers in Washington. He cared nothing for style, appearances and public perception, and he had little money for renovations. He needed a large space with utilities, nothing else. He wasn't trying to attract clients because he had more than he could handle. The death penalty wars were raging and the prosecutors were on a roll. Amos spent a few bucks on paint, drywall and plumbing and moved his growing staff into the old Pontiac place. Almost immediately, the lawyers and paralegals at CDI adopted a defensive attitude toward their sparse and eclectic workplace. Who else practiced law in a converted bay where they once changed oil and installed mufflers? There was no reception area because there were no visiting clients. They were all on death row or some other unit in prisons from Virginia to Arizona. A receptionist was not needed because guests were not expected. Mitch rattled the bell on the front door, stepped into an open area that was once a showroom, and waited for human contact. He was amused by the decor, which was primarily posters advertising shiny new Pontiacs from decades earlier, calendars dating to the 1950s, and a few framed headlines of cases in which the CDI had managed to save a life. There were no carpets, no rugs, the floors were quite original. Shiny concrete with permanent stains of paint and oil. Good morning, said a young lady as she hustled by with a stack of papers. Good morning, Mitch replied. I'm supposed to see Amos Patrick at nine o'clock. She had merely greeted him and had not offered to help. She managed a tense smile as if she had better things to do and said, Okay, I'll tell him but it might be a while. We're in the middle of a bad morning. She was gone. No invitation to have a seat, certainly no offer of coffee. And what, exactly, might constitute a bad morning in a law firm where every case dealt with death? In spite of the tall front windows with plenty of sunlight, the place had a tense, almost dreary feel to it as if most days began badly with the lawyers up early and fighting deadlines across the country. There were three plastic chairs in a corner with a coffee table covered in old magazines. The waiting room, of sorts. Mitch sat down, pulled out his phone, and began checking emails. At 9.30, he stretched his legs, watched the traffic on Summer Avenue, called the office because it was expected, and fought off irritation. 
In his world of clock-driven precision, being half an hour late for an appointment was rare and expected to occur only with a suitable explanation. But he reminded himself that this was a pro bono matter and he was donating his time. At 9.50, a kid in jeans stepped around a corner and said, Mr. McDear, this way. Thanks. Mitch followed him out of the showroom and passed a large counter where, according to a faded sign, they once sold auto parts. They went through a wide swinging door and into a hallway. The kid stopped at a closed door and said, Amos is waiting. Thanks. Mitch stepped inside and got himself bear-hugged by Amos Patrick, a wild-looking character with a mass of unruly gray hair and an unkempt beard. After the hug, they shook hands and exchanged preliminary chit-chat. Willie Backstrom, other acquaintances, the weather. Would you like an espresso? Amos asked. Sure. Sure. Single or double? What are you having? A triple. Make it two. Amos smiled and walked to a counter where he kept an elaborate Italian espresso machine with an inventory of various beans and cups. The man was serious about his coffee. He took two of the larger cups. Real, not paper. Punched some buttons and waited for the grinding to start. They sat in a corner of his rambling office under an overhead door that hadn't been lowered in years. Mitch couldn't help but notice that Amos's eyes were red and puffy. Gravely, he said, Look, Mitch, I'm afraid you've wasted a trip down. I'm really sorry, but there's nothing you can do. Okay. Willie warned me. Oh no, not that. Much worse. Early this morning, they found Tad Kearney hanging from an electrical cord in the shower. Looks like he beat him to the punch. His voice choked and went silent. Mitch could think of no response. Amos cleared his throat and managed to say almost in a whisper, they're calling it a suicide. I'm sorry. For a long time, they sat in silence, the only sound being the dripping of coffee. Amos wiped his eyes with a tissue then struggled to his feet, retrieved the cups, and placed them on a small table. He walked to his remarkably cluttered desk, picked up a sheet of paper, and handed it to Mitch. This came across about an hour ago. It was a shocking image of a naked, emaciated white man hanging grotesquely from an electrical cord cutting into the flesh of his neck and looped over an exposed pipe. Mitch took one look, turned away, and handed it back. Sorry about that, Amos said. Wow. Happens all the time in prison, but not on death row. More silence followed as they sipped espresso. Mitch could think of nothing to say, but the message was clear. The suicide was suspicious. Amos stared at a wall and said softly, I love that guy. He was crazy as hell and we fought all the time, but I felt such sympathy for him. I learned a long time ago not to get emotionally involved with my clients, but with Tad I couldn't help it. Kid never had a chance in life, doomed from the day he was born, which is not unusual. Why did he fire you? Oh, he fired me several times. It got to be a joke, really. Tad was street smart and taught himself the law, thought he knew more than any of his lawyers. I stuck with him, though. You've been through it. It's hard not to get consumed by these desperate men. I've lost two of them. I've lost twenty, now twenty-one. But Tad will always be special. I represented him for eight years, and during that time he never had a visitor. No friends, no family, no one but me and a chaplain. Talk about a lonely soul living in a cage in solitary with no one on the outside, only a lawyer. His mental state deteriorated over the years, and the last few times I visited him, he refused to say a word. Then he would write me a five-page letter filled with thoughts and ramblings so incoherent it should have been clear proof of his schizophrenia. But you tried insanity. Tried, yes, but 
got nowhere. The state fought us at every turn and the courts had no sympathy. We tried everything, and we had a fighting chance a few months ago when he decided to fire his legal team. Not a smart move. What about guilt? Amos took another sip and shook his head. Well, the facts were not in his favor, shall we say. A drug runner caught in a sting with narcs, three of whom took bullets to the head and died at the scene. Not a lot of jury appeal. The deliberations lasted about an hour. So he did kill them. Oh, yes. Shot two in the forehead from forty feet away. The third one took a bullet in the chin. Tad, you see, was an expert shot. Grew up with guns everywhere. In every car and truck, every closet, every drawer. As a kid, he could hit targets practically blindfolded. The narcs picked the wrong guy to ambush. Mitch let the word rattle around the room for a moment, then said, Ambush. It's a long story, Mitch, so I'll give you a quick skinny. Back in the 90s, there was a gang of rogue DEAA agents who decided the best way to win the war on drugs was to kill the smugglers. They worked with informants, snitches, and other thugs in the trade and set up sting operations. When the delivery boys showed up with the goods, the agents simply killed them. No need to bother with arrests and trials and such, just vigilante justice that was bought hook, line, and sinker by the authorities and the press. Pretty effective way of putting the runners out of business. Mitch was speechless and decided to drink his coffee and listen. To this day, they've never been exposed, so no one knows how many traffickers they ambushed. And, frankly, no one cares. Looking back, it appears as though they lost some of their enthusiasm when Tad shot three of their buddies. Happened about twenty miles north of Memphis at a rural drop-off point. There were some suspicions some of the lawyers were putting the pieces together, but no one really wanted to dig too deep. These were nasty, violent men of the law who made their own rules. Those who knew about it were only too happy to help with the cover-up. And you knew. Let's say I suspected, but we don't have the manpower to investigate something this unbelievable. My wagon is fully loaded with deadlines elsewhere. Tad, though always knew it was an ambush, and he was making some pretty wild accusations when he fired us. I think he was on to something. Again, the poor kid was so mentally unbalanced it was hard to take him seriously. What are the chances it was not a suicide? Amos grunted and wiped his nose with the back of his sleeve. I would bet good money, and I don't have much, that Tad didn't die by his own hand. I'll speculate and say that the authorities wanted to keep him quiet until they could kill him properly in July. And we'll never know because the investigation, if you could call it that, will be a whitewash. There's no way to find the truth, Mitch. Another one's gone and nobody cares. He sniffled and wiped his eyes again. I'm sorry. Mitch was somewhat surprised that a lawyer who had lost twenty clients to executions would be so emotional. Wouldn't you get callous and jaded after a few? He had no plans to find out. His time in this little corner of the pro bono world had just come to an end. And I'm sorry too, Mitch. Sorry you made the trip down. No problem. It was worth it to meet you and see your office. Amos waved at the overhead door attached to the ceiling. What do you think? Who else practices law in an old Pontiac place? Betcha don't have one of these in New York. Probably not. Give it a try. We have an opening guy quit last week. Mitch smiled and suppressed a laugh. No offense, but the salary would be less than his property taxes in Manhattan. Thanks, but I've tried Memphis. I remember. The Bendini story was a big one around here for a while. An entire firm blows up and everybody goes to prison. Who could forget it? But your name was hardly mentioned. I got lucky and got out.
and you're not coming back. And I'm not coming back. Chapter 4 In his rental car, Mitch called his secretary and asked her to change his travel plans. He'd missed the morning non-stop to LaGuardia. Connecting flights would take hours and send him crisscrossing most of the country. There was a direct from Nashville at 5.20, and she got him a ticket. Getting to the airport would dovetail nicely with an idea he'd been kicking around. The traffic thinned and Memphis was behind him before an unexpected wave of exhilaration hit hard. He had just dodged an awful experience, and the rogue DAA subplot was enough to give a lawyer ulcers, at best. He had taken one for the team, notched a huge favor with Willie Backstrom, and was fleeing Memphis again, this time without threats and other baggage. With plenty of time, he stayed on the two-lane highways and enjoyed a peaceful drive. He ignored some calls from New York, checked in with Abby, and loafed at 50 miles an hour. The town of Sumrall was two hours east of Memphis, one hour west of Nashville. It was the county seat and had a population of 18,000, a big number for that part of the rural south. Mitch followed the signs and soon found himself on Main Street, which was one side of the town square. A well-preserved 19th-century courthouse sat in the center of the square with statues, gazebos, monuments, and benches scattered about, all protected by the shade of massive oak trees. Mitch parked in front of a dress shop and walked around the square. As always, there was no shortage of lawyers and small firms. Again, he wondered why his old friend would choose such a life. They met at Harvard in the late fall of Mitch's third year when the most prestigious law firms made their annual trek to the school. The recruiting game was the payoff, not for hard work because that was the drill at every law school, but for being smart and lucky enough to get accepted to Harvard. For a poor kid like Mitch, the recruiting was especially thrilling because he could smell money for the first time in his life. Lamar had been sent with the team because he was only seven years older than Mitch, and a more youthful image was always important. He and his wife Kay had embraced the McDeers as soon as they arrived in Memphis. There had been no contact in 15 years. The Internet made it easy to snoop around and see what folks were doing, especially lawyers, who was a breed, and regardless of their success or lack of it, enjoyed all the attention they could generate. It was good for business. Lamar's website was rather simple, but then so was his practice. The bland offering of deeds, wills, no fault, divorces, property transactions, and, of course, personal injuries. Every small-town lawyer dreamed of landing some good car wrecks. There was no mention of such unpleasantries as Lamar's indictment, guilty plea, and prison sentence. His office was above a sporting goods store. Mitch lumbered up the creaky steps, took a deep breath, and opened the door. A large woman behind a computer screen paused and offered a sweet smile. Good morning. Good morning. Is Lamar around? He's in court she said, nodding behind her in the general direction of the courthouse. A trial. No, just a hearing. Should be over soon. Can I help you? Mitch handed her a scully business card and said, Name's Mitch McDear. I'll try to catch him over there. Which courtroom? There's only one. Second floor. Right. Thanks. It was a handsome courtroom of the old variety. Stained wood trimmings, tall windows, portraits of white, dead male dignitaries on the walls. Mitch eased in and took a seat on the back row. He was the only spectator. The judge was gone, and Lamar was chatting with another lawyer. When he finally saw Mitch, he was startled but kept talking. When he finished, he slowly made his way down the center aisle and stopped at the end of the row. It was almost noon and the courtroom was empty. They watched each other for a moment before Lamar asked, What are you doing here? Just passing through. 
It was a sarcastic response. Only a lost idiot would be passing through such a backwater place as Sumrall. I'll ask again. What are you doing here? I was in Memphis last night, had some business that got cancelled. My flight is out of Nashville in a few hours, so I made the drive. Thought I'd stop by and say hello. Lamar had lost so much hair he was hardly recognizable. What remained was gray. Like a lot of men, he was trying to replace the thinness on top with the thickness of a beard. But it too was gray as it usually is and only added to the aging. He eased down the row in front of Mitch, stopped ten feet away, and leaned on the pew in front. He had yet to smile and asked, Anything in particular you want to discuss? Not really. I think about you occasionally and just wanted to say hello. Hello? You know, Mitch. I think about you too. I spent twenty-seven months in a federal pen because of you, so you're rather hard to forget. You spent twenty-seven months in a federal pen because you were a willing member of a criminal conspiracy, one that tried its best to entice me to join. I managed to escape. Barely. You got a grudge, so do I. In the background, a clerk walked in front of the bench. They watched her and waited until she was gone, then resumed staring at each other. Lamar gave a slight shrug and said, Okay, fair enough. I did the crime and did the time. It's not something I dwell on. I'm not here to start trouble. I was hoping we could have a pleasant chat and bury the hatchet, so to speak. Lamar took a deep breath and said, Well, if nothing else, I admire you for being here. I thought I'd never see you again. Same here. You were the only real friend I had back in those days, Lamar. We had some good times together, in spite of the pressure and all. Abby and Kay hit it off nicely. We have fond memories of you guys. Well, we don't. We lost everything, Mitch, and it was easy to blame it all on you. The firm was going down, Lamar, you know that. The FBI was hot on the trail and closing in. They picked me because I was the new guy, and they figured I was the weak link. And they were right. Damn right they were. Since I had done nothing wrong, I made the decision to protect myself. I cooperated and ran like a scared dog. The FBI couldn't even find me. Where'd you go? Mitch smiled and slowly got to his feet. That, my friend, is a long story. Can I buy lunch? No, but let's find a table. The first cafe on the square was crowded with too many lawyers. According to Lamar, they walked another block and found a table in a sandwich shop in the basement of an old hardware store. Each paid for his own lunch and they sat in a corner, away from the crowd. So, how's Kay? Mitch asked. He assumed they were still married. His cursory internet sleuthing had found no records of a divorce in the past ten years. From time to time, Mitch would recall a face or a name from back then and waste a few minutes online digging for dirt. After fifteen years, though, his curiosity was waning. He took no notes and kept no files. She's fine, selling medical supplies for a nice company. Doing well. And Abby. The same. She's an editor with a publishing company in the city. Lamar took a bite of a turkey roll and nodded along. Epicurean Press, senior editor, a fondness for Italian food and wine. He had found some of her books at a store in Nashville and flipped through the pages. Unlike Mitch, he was keeping a file. Scully, partner. International lawyer. The file existed solely for his own curiosity and had no other value. Kids. Twin boys, age eight, Carter and Clark. Yours? Wilson is a freshman at Suwanee. Suzanne is in high school. You landed on your feet nicely, didn't you, Mitch? A partner in a major firm, offices around the world and all that. 
living the fast life in the big city. The rest of us went to prison while you managed to get out. I didn't deserve prison, Lamar, and I was lucky to get out alive. Think of the ones who didn't make it, including your friends. As I recall, there were five mysterious deaths in about ten years. That about right? Lamar nodded as he chewed. He swallowed and washed it down with iced tea through a straw. You vanished into thin air. How'd you do it? You really want the story? Definitely. It's been a big question for a long time. Okay. I have a brother named Ray who is in prison. I convinced the feds to release him in return for my cooperation. He went to Grand Cayman, met a friend there, and arranged a boat ride. A thirty-foot sloop. Real nice. Not that I know much about boats. Abby and I sneaked out of Memphis with the clothes on our backs and went to Florida, near Destin. We rendezvoused with the boat and sailed off into the night. We spent a month on Grand Cayman, then sailed to another island. And you had plenty of money. Well, yes. I compensated myself with some of the firm's dirty money and the feds let it slide. After a few months we got tired of the islands and began traveling, always looking over our shoulders. Life on the run is not sustainable. But the FBI was helping you. Sure. I gave them all the documents they needed, but I did not agree to testify at trial. I was not going back to Memphis. As you know, there were no trials. Oh, no. We fell like dominoes. They offered me three years for cooperation or go to trial and face at least twenty. We all caved. The key was Oliver Lambert. They squeezed him till he choked. When he flipped, we were all sitting ducks. And he died in prison. May he rest in peace, the bastard. Royce McKnight shot himself after he got out. Avery, as you probably know, got himself rubbed out by the mob. The firm's final chapter is not pretty. No one returned to Memphis. No one was from there to begin with. Since we were all a bunch of disbarred and convicted felons, we scattered and tried to forget about each other. Bendini is not a popular topic. Mitch stabbed an olive at the bottom of his salad and ate it. No contact with anyone. No, not at all. It was a nightmare. One day you're a hotshot lawyer with a fancy pedigree and plenty of money. All the toys. Then, bam, before you know it, the FBI is raiding the place, flashing badges, making threats, grabbing computers, locking the doors. We fled in shock and scrambled to find good criminal lawyers. There were only so many in Memphis. For months we waited for the hammer to fall, and when it did, our world came to an end. My first night in jail was horrific. I thought I was about to be attacked. I spent three nights before bonding out. Every day, it seemed as if there was more bad news. Someone else had flipped and was cooperating. I pled guilty in federal court in downtown Memphis. You know the courtroom, with Kay and my parents in the front row, all crying. I thought about suicide every day. Then I shipped out. First stop was Leavenworth in Kansas. A lawyer in prison gives the guards and other inmates an easy target for abuse. Luckily, it was only verbal. He took another bite and seemed tired of talking. Mitch said, I didn't intend to bring up the part about prison, Lamar. Sorry. It's all right. I survived and I got stronger. I was lucky because Kay stuck with me, though it wasn't easy. We lost the house and other stuff, but it's all just stuff. You realize what's important. She and the kids were tough and held on. Her parents were a big help. But there were so many divorces, so many ruined lives. I hit bottom after a year and made the decision that prison would not destroy me. I worked in the law library and helped a lot of guys. I also began studying for the bar exam, again. 
I was planning my comeback. How many of our former friends are practicing now? Lamar smiled and grunted as if to say none. I don't know of anyone. It's virtually impossible with a felony conviction. But I had a spotless record in prison, waited my time, passed the bar exam, got plenty of recommendations and so on. I was turned down twice, but the third time worked. Now I'm a small town ham and egg lawyer trying to eke out 60,000 bucks a year. Thankfully, Kay makes more than that so we can afford tuition. He took a quick bite and said, I'm tired of talking. How did you go from a beach bum to a partner at Scully? Mitch smiled and drank some tea. The beach bum part didn't last very long, got bored with it. It was okay for about a month, but then real life sort of returned. We left the islands and hiked around Europe for several months, living out of our backpacks and taking the trains. One day we found ourselves in this picturesque little town in Tuscany. Cortona, not far from Perugia. Never been to Italy. A beautiful town in the mountains. We walked past a small cottage just off the town square and saw a sign in the window. It was for rent, 300 euros a month. We thought, what the heck? We had so much fun the first month, we signed up for another. The lady who owned the cottage also ran a bed and breakfast not far away, and she kept it filled with American and British tourists who wanted cooking lessons. Abby signed up and quickly became consumed with Italian cooking. Me, I was concentrating on the wines. Three months, then four, then five, and we leased the cottage for a year. Abby worked in the kitchen as a sous chef while I puttered around the countryside, trying to imitate a real Italian. We hired a private tutor for language lessons and went all in. After a year, we refused to speak English around the house. Meanwhile, I was in prison. Are you going to keep blaming me for that? Lamar folded the wax paper around the remnants of his wrap and shoved it aside. No, Mitch. As of today, I'm letting go. Thanks. Me too. So how did Scully and Pershing enter the picture? After three years, it was time to move on. Both of us wanted a career and a family. We settled in London, and on a whim, I went to the Scully office there and asked around. A law degree from Harvard opens a lot of doors. They offered a position as an associate and I took it. After two years in London, we decided to return to the States. Plus, Abby was pregnant, and we wanted to raise the kids here. That's my story. I like yours better than mine. You seem content. We're happy and healthy. Nothing else matters. Mitch rattled the ice in his empty cup. The wrap and the salad were finished, as was lunch. Lamar smiled and said, Several years ago I was in New York. A small business matter for a client. I took a cab down to 110 Broad Street, your building, and I stood outside and looked up at the tower, 80 floors. A spectacular building, but only one of a thousand. International headquarters of Scully and Pershing. The largest law firm the world has ever known, but just another name on the crowded directory. I went inside and marveled at the atrium. Banks of elevators. Escalators running in all directions. Baffling modern art that cost a fortune. I sat on a bench and watched the people come and go the frantic hustling of young, well-dressed professionals, half of them on their phones, frowning, talking, importantly, all sprinting at a breakneck pace to make the next dollar. I wasn't looking for you, Mitch, but I was certainly thinking about you. I asked myself, what if he saw me and walked over right now? What would I say? What would he say? I had no answer, but I did feel a twinge of pride that you, an old friend, had indeed made the big time. You survived Bendini and you're now playing on a world stage. 
I wish I'd seen you sitting there. It's impossible because no one looks up. No one takes a moment to appreciate the surroundings, the art, the architecture. Rat race is the perfect description of it. I'm happy there, Lamar. We have a good life. Then I'm happy for you. If you ever come back to the city, we would love to host you and Kay. Lamar smiled and shook his head. Mitch, my old pal, that'll never happen. Chapter 5 It was almost midnight when Mitch stepped off the elevator and entered his apartment. The return trip was finally over and nothing had gone as scheduled. Delays ruled the evening. Boarding, taxiing, taking off. Even the cold dinner was served late. It took half an hour to get a cab at LaGuardia, and a wreck on the Queensboro Bridge wasted another forty minutes. His day had begun on time with a quiet breakfast at the Peabody. After that, nothing had gone as planned. But he was home and little else mattered. The twins had been sleeping for hours. Normally, Abby would have been too, but she was on the sofa reading and waiting. He kissed her and asked, why are you still up? Because I want to hear all about your trip. He had called with the welcome news that the latest death row case had not materialized, and for that they were both relieved. He had not mentioned the detour to see Lamar Quinn. She poured him a glass of wine and they talked for an hour. He assured her more than once that there was no nostalgia for the old days. They had left nothing in Memphis. When he began to nod off, she ushered him to the bedroom. Five hours later, at exactly 6 a.m., the alarm clock pinged as always, and Mitch crawled out of bed, leaving his wife behind. His first chore of the morning was to prepare the coffee. While it was brewing, he opened his laptop and found the commercial appeal, the Memphis Daily. On the front page of the Metro section, the headline read, Tad Kearney found dead by suicide. The story could have been written by the warden himself. There was no doubt about the cause of death. No idea how the convicted cop killer found an electrical cord. Death row inmates were allowed two ten-minute showers per week, during which they were unmonitored. Prison officials were scratching their heads, but hey, it's prison and suicides happen all the time. Tad was about to get the needle anyway, and he'd fired his lawyers. Did anyone really care? The wife of one of the dead DEAA agents was quoted as saying, We're very disappointed. We wanted to be there and watch him take his last breath. His last lawyer, Amos Patrick of Memphis, was contacted but had no comment. The Nashville Tennessean was even less sympathetic. The condemned man had murdered three fine officers of the law in cold blood. To coin an original term, the jury had spoken. The system had worked. May he rest in peace. Mitch poured a cup of coffee, drank it black, and mumbled a prayer for Tad, then another one of thanks for dodging another messy, hopeless case. Assuming he had met Tad and somehow convinced him to sign on, Mitch would have spent the next ninety days scrambling to prove his client was legally insane. If he got lucky and found the right doctor, he would then frantically race to find a court that would listen. Every possible court had already said no to Tad. Every remaining strategy, and there were precious few, was a desperate long shot. Mitch would fly back and forth from New York to Memphis and Nashville, stay in budget motels, rack up thousands of miles with Hertz and Avis, and eat food that was a far cry from the delightful cuisine that came from Abby's kitchen. He would miss her and the twins, fall far behind with his paying clients, lose a month of sleep, and then spend the last 48 hours at the prison either yelling into the phone or staring at Tad through a row of bars and lying about their chances. Good morning. Abby said as she patted his shoulder. She poured a cup and sat at the table. Any good news from around the world? He closed his laptop and smiled at her. The usual. 
A recession is looming. Our invasion of Iraq looks even more misguided. The climate is heating up. Nothing new, really. Lovely. A couple of stories from down there about Tad Kearney killing himself. It's so tragic. It is. But my file is closed. And I've decided that my career as a death row lawyer is over. I think I've heard that before. Well, this time I'm serious. We'll see. Are you working late tonight? No. I'll be home around six, I think. Good. Remember that Laotian restaurant in the village about two months ago? Sure. How could I forget? Something Vang. Bida Vang. And the chef has a last name with at least ten syllables. He goes by Sean, and he's decided to do a cookbook. He'll be here tonight to destroy the kitchen. Wonderful. What's on the menu? Far too much, but he wants to experiment. He mentioned an herbal sausage and fried coconut rice, among others. Might want to skip lunch. Clark emerged from the darkness and went straight to his mother for a hug. Carter would be five minutes behind. Mitch poured two small glasses of orange juice and asked what was on tap at school that day. As always, Clark woke up slow and said little over breakfast. Carter, the chatterbox, usually handled both ends of the morning conversation. When the boys agreed on waffles and bananas, Mitch left the kitchen and went to shower. At 7.45 on the dot, the three guys hugged Abby goodbye and left for school. When he wasn't out of town... And when the weather permitted, Mitch walked the twins to school. The River Latin School was only four blocks away, and the walk was always a delight, especially when their father was with them. Near the school, other boys emerged, and it was obvious they had the same destination. They wore the uniform. Navy blazer, white shirt, and khakis. The shoes were free of the dress code and were a startling mix of high-end basketball sneakers, L.L. Bean hiking boots, dirty buckskins, and traditional loafers. Mitch and Abby still worried about their son's education. They were paying for the best in the city, but they, like most parents, wanted more diversity. Unlike the rest of the world, River Latin was 90% white and all-male. However, as products of mediocre public schools, they realized that they had only one opportunity to educate their children. For the moment, they could not foresee changing schools, but their concerns were growing. Without showing too much affection, Mitch said goodbye to the twins, promised to see them that night, and hustled toward the subway. As he entered the tower on Broad Street and walked through the soaring atrium, he paused to remember Lamar's story about his visit here. Mitch saw the chrome and leather benches against a glass wall and sat down for a moment. He smiled as he watched the ants marching. Hundreds of well-dressed young professionals like himself, eager to start the day and wishing the escalators would climb faster. It would indeed be a shock to a small-town lawyer with a laid-back practice. He was glad he'd made the effort to see his old friend, but it would never happen again. Lamar had not offered a hand to shake as Mitch left. There were simply too many unpleasant memories. And that was fine with Mitch. He glanced at his watch and realized that about 24 hours earlier, he had been sitting in the former showroom of a Pontiac dealership in a shady part of Memphis, waiting and waiting for a meeting he wanted no part of. The sharp sound of the word Mitch interrupted his random thoughts and brought him back to reality. Willie Backstrom was walking over, thick briefcase hanging from a leather strip over his shoulder. Mitch stood and said, Good morning, Willie. I've been here for thirty years and I've never seen anyone use those benches. You okay? We're too busy to sit down. Seriously, how can you bill a client when you're sitting in the lobby? Do it all the time. They walked away and joined the crowd at a wall of elevators. Once they were packed inside and moving up, Willie said softly, If you get a minute, stop by today and let's talk about Amos. Sure. You ever been to the Pontiac place? 
No, but I've heard about it for years. I got the impression that a visiting lawyer can get a lube job while taking a deposition. The top man at Scully Pershing was Jack Rush, a 40-year veteran still hitting it hard in the final months as he neared the finish line of his 70th birthday. The firm mandated retirement at 70 with no exceptions. As a policy, it was wise but widely unpopular. Most of the older partners were renowned experts in their fields and were billing at the highest rates. When forced out, they took their expertise with them, as well as the long-trusted relationships with their clients. On the one hand, it seemed short-sighted to set such an arbitrary deadline, but youth demanded it. Forty-something partners like Mitch wanted to see room at the top. The young associates were super ambitious and many refused to join big firms that did not clear the deck by shoving out the old guys. So Jack Roosh was counting the days. His official title was managing partner. And as such, he ran the firm much like a high-powered corporate CEO. It was a law firm, though, an organization of proud professionals, not a corporation. And the titles were much weightier. Managing partner it was. When Jack called, every lawyer in the building dropped what he or she was doing because whatever he or she was doing was not nearly as crucial as whatever Jack might have on his mind. But he was a skillful manager and knew better than to interrupt and throw his weight around. His email asked Mitch to appear at his office at 10 a.m. if convenient. Convenient or not, Mitch planned to be there five minutes early. He was, and a secretary led him into the splendid corner office suite at precisely 10 a.m. She poured coffee from a silver pitcher and asked Mitch if he wanted something from the daily platter of fresh pastries on the credenza. Mitch, mindful of Chan and his band of Laotian Sioux chefs set to invade his kitchen in a few hours, thanked her and declined. They sat around a small coffee table in a corner of the suite. From sixty floors up, the views of the harbor were even more impressive, though Mitch was far too focused to venture a glimpse. Those who worked in Manhattan's tallest buildings were adept at ignoring the views while visitors gawked. Jack was tanned and fit and wearing another one of his fine linen suits. He could pass for a man fifteen years younger and it seemed a shame to show him the door but he had no time to dwell on a policy that he had agreed to thirty years earlier and wasn't about to change. I spoke to Luca yesterday, he said rather gravely. Obviously, something heavy was going down. In the vast universe of Scully, there was only one Luca. Twenty years earlier, when American Big Law went on a merging binge and gobbled up firms around the world, Scully had managed to convince Lucas Androni to join forces. He had built a sterling international firm in Rome and was widely respected throughout Europe and North Africa. How is Luca? Not good. He was not specific, rather vague, actually, but he had a bad trip to the doctor's office and got some unwelcome news. He didn't say what it was and I didn't ask. That's awful. Mitch knew him well. Luca was in New York several times a year and enjoyed a good time. He had dined at Abby's table and the McDeers had stayed at his spacious villa in central Rome. That the young American couple had lived in Italy and knew the culture and language meant a lot to him. He wants you in Rome as soon as possible. Odd that he didn't contact Mitch directly with the request but Luca was always respectful of the chain of command. By going through Jack, the message was being delivered that Mitch should drop everything and go to Rome. Of course, any idea what he wants. It involves Lanak, the Turkish construction company. I've done some work for Lanak, but not much. Luca has represented the company forever, a great client. Now there's another dust-up in Libya and Lanak's in the middle of it. Mitch nodded properly and tried to suppress a smile. Sounded like another great adventure. In his four years as a partner, he had established a reputation as a sort of legal SWAT team leader, sent in by Scully to rescue clients in distress. 
It was a role he relished and tried to expand while guarding it as his own. Jack continued, as usual, Luca was light on the details. He still doesn't like the phone and hates email. As you know, he prefers to discuss business over a long Roman lunch, preferably outdoors. Sounds dreadful. I'm leaving Sunday. Chapter 6 Scully Pershing was known for its lavish offices wherever it ventured. Now in 31 cities on five continents and counting, because for Scully the numbers were important, at least prime space in the most prestigious addresses, usually taller and newer towers designed by the trendiest of architects. It sent in its own team of decorators who filled each suite with art, fabrics, furnishings, and lighting indigenous to the locale. Enter any Scully office, and your senses were touched by the look, feel, and expensive taste. Its clients expected as much. For the hourly rates they paid, they wanted to see success. In his eleven years with the firm, Mitch had visited about a dozen of its offices, mainly in the United States and Europe, and truthfully, the shine was wearing off. Each was different, but all were similar, and he had reached the point of not slowing down long enough to appreciate the serious money on the walls and floors. After a while, they were beginning to blur together. But he reminded himself that the opulence was not for his benefit. It was all a show for others. Well-heeled clients, prospective associates, and visiting lawyers. He caught himself mumbling like the other partners about the expense of maintaining such a facade. Much of that money could have trickled down to the partners' pockets. Things were different in Rome. There, the offices, as well as every other aspect of the practice, were under the thumb of Luca Sandroni, the founder. For over thirty years, he had slowly built a firm that was housed in a four-story stone building with no elevators and limited views. It was tucked away on Via della Paglia near the Piazza Santa Maria, in the Trastevere neighborhood of Old Rome. All of the buildings around it were four-storied stucco with red-tiled roofs, and tastefully showed the wear and tear of being built centuries earlier. Romans, new and old, never cared much for tall buildings. Mitch had been there many times and loved the place. It was a step back in time and a welcome break from the relentlessly modern image of the rest of Scully. No other office in the firm had such history, nor did they dare say, slow down when you entered. Luca and his team worked hard and enjoyed the prestige and money, but they were Italians and refused to succumb to the workaholism expected by the Americans. Mitch stopped in the alley and admired the massive double doors. An old sign beside them read, Sandroni Studio Legal. The merger with Luca allowed him to keep his firm's name, a point he would not concede. For a moment, Mitch thought of the law offices he'd seen that week. From his own shiny tower in Manhattan, to the grungy Pontiac place in Memphis, to Lamar Quinn's sleepy little suite upstairs above the town square. And now this. He stepped through the doors and into a narrow foyer, where Mia was always sitting. She smiled, jumped to her feet, and greeted Mitch with the obligatory dramatic peck on both cheeks a ritual that still made him a bit uncomfortable. They spoke in Italian and covered the basics. His flight, Abby, the boys, the weather. He sat across from her, sipped espresso that always tasted better in Rome, and finally got around to Luca. She frowned slightly but revealed nothing. Her phone kept ringing. Luca was waiting in his office, the same one he'd had for decades. It was small by Scully's standards, at least for a managing partner, but he could not have cared less. He welcomed Mitch with more hugs and kisses and the usual greetings. If he was sick, it wasn't apparent. He waved at a small coffee table in a corner, his favorite meeting place, as his secretary inquired about drinks and pastries. How is the beautiful Abby? Luca asked in perfect English with only a trace of an accent. 
His second law degree was from Stanford. He also spoke French and Spanish, and years earlier could handle Arabic but had lost it through neglect. As they caught up on the McDear family front, Mitch began to notice a weaker voice, but only slightly. When he lit a cigarette, Mitch said, Still smoking, I see. Lucas shrugged as if the smoking couldn't possibly be related to a health issue. A double window was open and the smoke made its way through it. Piazza Santa Maria was below and the sounds of the busy street life emanated upward. Mia brought coffee on a silver tray and poured it for them. Mitch tiptoed through the minefield of Luca's family. He had been married and divorced twice and it was never clear if his current companion had lasting potential. Not that Mitch or anyone else for that matter would dare to ask. He had two adult children with his first wife. A woman Mitch had never met and a teenager with his second. A hot young paralegal broke up the first marriage, then ruined the second by cracking up and fleeing with their love child to Spain. Amidst that wreckage, the bright spot was his daughter, Giovanna, who was a Scully associate in London. Five years earlier, Luca had finessed the firm's nepotism rules and quietly landed her a job. According to the firm gossip, she was as brilliant and driven as her father. While his private life had been chaotic, his professional career was without a blemish. The Sandroni studio, Ligale, had been romanced by all the players in Big Law before Luca finally got the deal he wanted with Scully. I'm afraid I have a slight problem, Mitch, he said sadly. With years of practice, he had flattened out almost every wrinkle in his accent, but Mitch still sounded more like Mitch. The doctors have run tests for a month now, and they finally agree that I have a cancer. A bad one. In the pancreas. Mitch closed his eyes as his shoulders sagged. If there was a worse cancer, he was not aware of it. I'm so sorry, he whispered. The prognosis is not good and I'm in for a bad time. I'm taking a leave of absence while the doctors do their work. Maybe I'll get lucky. I'm so sorry, Luca. This is awful. It is, but my spirits are good and there are always miracles. Or so my priest tells me. I'm spending more time with him these days. He managed to chuckle. I don't know what to say, Luca. There's nothing to say. It's top secret, classified and all that. I don't want my clients to know yet. If things deteriorate, then I'll gradually inform them. I'm already handing off some of my cases to the partners here. That's where you come in, Mitch. I'm here, ready to help. The most important matter on my desk right now involves Lanik, the Turkish contractor and a longtime client. An extremely valuable client, Mitch. I worked on one of their cases a few years back. Yes, I know and your work was superb. Lanik is one of the largest construction companies in the Middle East and Asia. They've built airports, highways, bridges, canals, dams, power plants, skyscrapers, you name it. The company is family-owned and is superbly managed. It delivers on time and on budget and knows how to do business in a world where everyone, from a Saudi prince to a cab driver in Kenya, has his hand out looking for a kickback. Mitch nodded along and noticed Luca's voice fading a little. On the flight to Rome, he had read the firm's internal client memos on Lanik. Headquarters in Istanbul, fourth largest Turkish contractor with estimated annual revenues of $2.5 billion. Large projects around the world, but especially in India and North Africa. An estimated 25,000 employees privately owned by the Selig family, who seemed to be as close-mouthed as a bunch of Swiss bankers. Family fortune, thought to be in the billion-plus range. But one guess was as good as the next. Luca lit another cigarette and half-heartedly blew smoke over his shoulder. Are you familiar with the great man-made river project in Libya? Mitch had read about it but only knew the basics. His knowledge, or lack thereof, didn't matter because Luca was in his storytelling mood. 
not really. Luca nodded at the correct response and said, goes back decades, but around 1970, five Colonel Gaddafi decided to build an underground canal to pump water from under the Sahara to the cities along the coast in northern Libya. When the oil company started poking around for oil 80 years ago, they found some huge aquifers deep beneath the desert. The idea was to pump the water out and send it to Tripoli and Benghazi, but the cost was far too much. Until they discovered oil. Gaddafi gave the project the green light, but most experts thought it was impossible. It took 30 years and $20 billion, but damned if the Libyans didn't pull it off. It worked, and Gaddafi declared himself a genius, something he has a habit of doing. Since he then had dominion over nature, he decided to create a river. There is not a single one in the entire country. Instead, they have seasonal riverbeds known as wadis, and these dry out in the summer. Gaddafi's next breathtaking project would be to combine some of the larger wadis, reroute the flow of water, make a permanent river, and build a magnificent bridge over it. A bridge in the desert. Yes, Mitch, a bridge in the desert, with delusional plans to link one side of the desert to the other and somehow build cities. Build a bridge and the traffic will find it. Six years ago, in 1999, Lanark signed a contract with the government for $800 million. Gaddafi wanted a billion-dollar bridge, so he ordered changes before construction started. In his newspapers, he posed for photos with models of the Great Gaddafi Bridge and told everyone it would cost a billion, all generated by Libyan oil. Not a dime would be borrowed. Because Lanark has done business in Libya for many years, they knew how chaotic things could be. Let's just say that Colonel Gaddafi and his warlords are not astute businessmen. They understand guns and oil. Contracts are often a nuisance. Lanark would not begin the job until the Libyans deposited 500 million U.S. dollars in a German bank. The four-year project took six years and is now complete which is a miracle and a testament to the tenacity of Lanark. The company met the terms of its contract. The Libyans have not. The overruns were horrendous. The Libyan government owes Lanark 400 million and won't pay. Thus, our claim. Luca put down his cigarette, picked up a remote, and aimed it at a flat screen on the wall. Wires ran from the screen to the floor where they joined other wires that snaked away in all directions. The current demands of technology required all kinds of devices, and since the walls were solid stone and two feet thick, the it guys did not drill. Mitch adored the contrast between the old and new. The latest gadgets wedged into a sprawling maze of rooms built before electricity and designed to last forever. The image on the screen was a color photo of a bridge, a towering suspension bridge over a dried-up riverbed with six-lane highways running to and from. Luca said, This is the great Gaddafi Bridge in central Libya, over an unnamed river yet to be found. It was and is a foolish idea because there are no people in the region and no one wants to go there. However, there is plenty of oil and maybe the bridge will get used after all. Lanark doesn't really care. It's not paid to plan Libya's future. It signed a contract to build the bridge and upheld its end of the deal. Now our client wants to be paid. Mitch enjoyed the conversation and wondered where it was going. He had a hunch and tried to control his excitement. Luca stubbed out his cigarette and closed his eyes as if in pain. He punched the remote and the screen went blank. I filed the claim in October with the United Arbitration Board in Geneva. I've been there several times. I know, and that's why I want you to take this case. Mitch tried to maintain a poker face but couldn't suppress a smile. Okay, why me? Because I know you can represent our client effectively, you can prevail in the case, and because we need an American in charge. 
The board's chairman, more formally known as the ruling magistrate, is from Harvard. Six of the 20 judges are American. There are three from Asia, and they usually go along with the Americans. I want you to take the case, Mitch, because I probably won't be around to see it through. His voice faded as he thought about dying. I'm honored, Luca. Of course, I'll take the case. Good. I talked to Jack Rush this morning and got the green light. New York is on board? Omar Selick, Lanark CEO, will be in London next week, and I'll try to arrange a meeting. The file is already thick, thousands of pages, so you need to catch up. I can't wait. Do the Libyans have a defense to the claim? The usual truckload of absurdities. Defective design, defective materials, unnecessary delays, lack of supervision, lack of control, unnecessary cost overruns. The Libyan government uses the Reed Moore law firm out of London for its dirty work, and you will not enjoy the experience. They are extremely aggressive and quite unethical. I know them. And our claim is bulletproof. Lucas smiled at the question and said, Well, as the attorney who filed the claim, I'll say that I have complete confidence in my client. Here's an example, Mitch. In the original design, the Libyans wanted a superhighway approaching the bridge from both directions. Eight lanes, mind you. There are not enough cars in the entire country to fill eight lanes. And they wanted eight lanes over the river. Lanark really balked and eventually convinced them that a four-lane bridge was more than adequate. The contract says four lanes. At some point, Gaddafi reviewed the project and asked about the eight lanes. He went nuts when his people told him the bridge would have only four lanes. The king wanted eight. Lanark finally talked him down to six and demanded a change order from the original design. Expanding from four lanes to six added about 200 million to the job, and the Libyans are now refusing to pay that. It was one major change order after another. To complicate matters, the market for crude oil cratered in Gaddafi ordered some stiff belt tightening, which in Libya means everything gets reduced but the military. When the Libyans were a hundred million dollars in arrears, Lanark threatened to stop working. So Gaddafi, being Gaddafi, sent the army, his revolutionary goons, to the job site to monitor the progress. No one got hurt, but things were tense. At about the time the bridge was finished, someone in Tripoli woke up and realized that it would never be used. So the Libyans lost interest in the project and refused to pay. So, Lanark is finished. All but the final punch list. The company always finishes, regardless of what the lawyers are doing. I suggest you go to Libya as soon as possible. And it's safe. Lucas smiled and shrugged and seemed winded. As safe as ever. I've been there several times, Mitch, and know it well. Gaddafi can be unstable, but he has an iron grip on the military and the police, and there's very little crime. The country is full of foreign workers, and he has to protect them. You'll have a security team. You'll be safe. For lunch, they strolled across the piazza to an outdoor bistro covered with large umbrellas. Without stopping, Lucas smiled at the hostess, said something to a waiter, and by the time he arrived at his table, the owner was greeting him with hugs and kisses. Mitch had eaten there before, and he often wondered why Luca chose the same place every day. In a city filled with great restaurants, why not explore a little? Again, though, he said nothing. He was an extra in Luca's world and thrilled to be included. A waiter poured sparkling water but did not offer menus. Luca wanted the usual. A small seafood salad with arugula and a side of sliced tomatoes and olive oil. Mitch ordered the same. Wine, Mitch? Luca asked. Only if you do. I'll pass. The waiter left. Mitch, 
I have a favor to ask. At that moment, how could Mitch possibly say no to any request? What is it? You've met my daughter, Giovanna. Yes, we had dinner in New York twice, I think. She was a summer intern for a law firm. Scadden, I believe. That's right. Well, as you know, she's in our London office, fifth year there, and doing well. I've discussed the Lana case with her, and she's eager to get involved. She's been cramped in the office for some time, the 90 hours a week routine, and she wants some fresh air and sunshine. You'll need several associates for the busy work, and I want you to include Giovanna. She's very bright and works hard. You won't be disappointed, Mitch. And, as Mitch vividly recalled, she was quite attractive. It was an easy request. There was plenty of grunt work ahead. Documents to read and categorize, discovery to decipher, depositions to plan, briefs to write. Mitch would supervise it all, but the tedium would be delegated to associates. Let's sign her up, he said. I'll call and welcome her aboard. Thank you, Mitch. She will be pleased. I'm trying to convince her to return to Rome, at least for the next year. I need her close by. Mitch nodded but could think of nothing to say. The food arrived and they busied themselves with lunch. The piazza was coming to life with midday traffic, as office workers left their buildings in search of something to eat. The foot traffic was fascinating and Mitch never tired of watching the people. Luca stopped eating as a sudden pain stiffened his back. It passed and he smiled at Mitch, as if all was well. Ever been to Libya, Mitch? No, it's never been on my list. Fascinating place, really. My father lived there in the 30s, before the war, back when Italy was trying to colonize the country. As you probably know, the Italians were not very good at the colonizing business. Leave it to the British, the French, the Spaniards, even the Dutch and Portuguese. For some reason, the Italians never got the hang of it. We bailed out after the war, but my father stayed in Tripoli until 1969, when Gaddafi took over in a military coup. Libya has a fascinating history, one worth taking a look at. Not only had Mitch never planned to visit the place, he had never been curious about its history. He smiled and said, I'll have a Ph.D. by next week. For the first ten years of my practice, I represented Italian companies doing business in Libya. I stayed there often, even had a little flat in Tripoli for a couple years. And there was a woman, a Moroccan. The twinkle was back in his eye. Mitch could not help but wonder how many girlfriends Luca had kept around the world in his day. She was a beauty he said softly, wistfully. Of course she was. Would Luca Sandroni waste time with a homely woman? Over espresso and the obligatory Italian post-lunch cigarette, Luca said. Why don't you stop off in London and see Giovanna? She'll be thrilled to be personally invited onto the case. And check on her. Tell her I'm doing fine. Are you doing fine, Luca? Not really. I have less than six months, Mitch. The cancer is aggressive and there's little I can do. The case is yours. Thank you, Luca, for the trust. You won't be disappointed. No, I won't. But I'm afraid I might not be around to see its conclusion. Chapter 7 Two hours before he was to board the non-stop flight from Rome to London, Mitch abruptly changed plans and got the last seat on a flight to New York's JFK. There were pressing matters at home. Dinner with Giovanna could wait. Confined to a narrow seat for eight hours, Mitch passed the time, as always, on long flights by diving into thick briefs, so boring they usually led to a long nap or two. First, he reviewed the docket and current membership of the United Arbitration Board and read the bios of its 20 members. 
They were appointed by one of the many committees at the United Nations and served five-year terms, with a lot of time spent in Geneva and with generous expense accounts. A former member once told Mitch, over drinks in New York, that the UAB was one of the best gigs in the world for aging lawyers with international pedigrees and contacts. As always, its roster was chock full of bright legal minds from every continent, most of whom had at one time or another passed through Ivy League law schools, either to study or teach. Its business was done in English and French, though all languages were welcome and could be accommodated. Two years earlier, Mitch had appeared before the board and argued a case on behalf of an Argentine grain cooperative seeking damages against a South Korean importer. He and Abby spent three honeymoon-like days in Geneva and still talked about it. He won the case, collected the money, and sent a hefty bill to Buenos Aires. Winning cases before the UAB was not that difficult if the facts fell into place. It had jurisdiction because the contracts, like the one for the bridge project between Lanark and the Libyan government, had a clearly written clause requiring both parties to submit their disputes to the UAB. In addition, Libya, like virtually every other nation, was a signatory to various treaties designed to facilitate international commerce and make the bad actors. And there was never a shortage of them. Behave. Winning was relatively easy. Collecting an award was another matter. Dozens of rogue states willingly signed whatever contracts and treaties were necessary to get the business, with no intention of paying the damages that became due at arbitration. The more Mitch read, the more he realized that Libya had a long history of trying to walk away from deals that looked promising at contract but went sour. According to Scully's intelligence, the bridge was a perfect example of Gaddafi's erratic dreaming. He became enamored with the vision of a soaring structure in the middle of a desert and ordered it built. Then he lost interest and moved on to other important projects. At some point, someone convinced him it was a bad idea, but by then, those pesky Turks were demanding serious money. Luca's UAB claim ran for 90 pages, and by the time Mitch had read it once, he was almost asleep. The pressing matter at home was a youth baseball game in Central Park. Carter and Clark played for the Bruisers, a serious contender in the under-8 division of the city's police league. Carter was the catcher and loved the dirt and sweat. Clark roamed the outfield and missed half the action. Mitch had almost no time to help coach the team, but he volunteered as the bench coach and tried to keep the lineup straight. It was a crucial task because if any kid, regardless of talent or interest, played one inning less than the others, his parents would be waiting in ambush after the game. After a few light skirmishes with parents, Mitch was already plotting ways to interest the twins in individual sports such as golf and tennis. However, some of those parents were just as terrifying. Perhaps hiking and skiing might be more enjoyable. The boys stood shoulder to shoulder in the foyer as Mitch inspected their uniforms. Abby was worrying about the time. They were already running late. They left in a rush and hurried along 68th Street to Central Park West. The teams were on one of the many fields of the Great Lawn, limbering up in the outfield as coaches yelled and parents huddled in the falling temperatures. Hiding in the dugout presented its own challenges, but Mitch preferred it to the bleachers where the adults chatted nonstop about careers, real estate, new restaurants, new nannies, new trainers, schools, and so on. The umpires arrived and the game began. For 90 minutes, Mitch sat on the bench, surrounded by a dozen eight-year-olds, and managed to shut out the rest of the world. He kept the scorebook, made the substitutions, huddled with Molly, the head coach, chided the umpires, ribbed the opposing coach, and treasured the moments when his own son sat beside him and talked baseball. The bruisers crushed the Rams, and at the final out the players and coaches lined up for the post-game handshaking rituals. The staff, Molly and Mitch, were determined to teach their players the virtues of sportsmanship, and they led by example. 
Winning was always fun, but winning with class was far more important. In a crowded city with far too few fields and an abundance of kids, the games were limited by time, not innings. Another one was scheduled to start right away, and it was important to clear the field. The victorious bruisers and their parents walked to a pizzeria on Columbus Avenue where they commandeered a long table in the back and ordered dinner. The fathers had tall beers, the mothers Chardonnay. While the players, all proud of their dirty uniforms, devoured pizza as they watched the Mets on a big screen. Almost all the fathers were in finance, law, or medicine, and they were from well-to-do families from across the country. As a general rule, they didn't talk much about where they were from. There was always plenty of good-natured talk about college football rivalries, favorite golf courses and such, but the conversations rarely drifted to their hometowns. They were in New York now, on the biggest stage, living the big life proud of their success, and they considered themselves real New Yorkers. Danesboro, Kentucky, was another world, and Mitch never mentioned it. He thought of it, though, as he watched his own boys laugh and chatter with their friends. He had played all the sports the small town had to offer, and he could not remember a single game when his parents were watching. His father died when he was just a boy, and afterward, his mother worked in low-wage jobs to support him and his brother, Ray. She never had the time to watch a ball game. What lucky kids these were. Affluent lives, private schools, and supportive parents who were too involved in their activities. Mitch often worried that his kids would be too pampered and too soft, but Abby disagreed. Their school was demanding and pushed the students to achieve and excel. Carter and Clark were, at least so far, well-rounded and being taught proper values both at school and at home. Abby was startled at the news that Luca was gravely ill. She had met many Scully partners, probably too many from all over the world, and Luca was by far her favorite. She wasn't keen on the idea of Mitch traveling to Libya. But if Luca said it was safe, then she wouldn't push back. Not that it would do any good. Since he made partner four years earlier, Mitch had become a seasoned traveler. She often went with him, especially when the destination was exciting. European cities were her favorite. Between her parents, her kid sister, and a collection of nannies, babysitting was rarely a problem. But the boys were getting older and more active, and Abby feared her globe-trotting days were about to be curtailed. She also suspected, though, had said nothing, that her husband's success would mean even more time away from home. Late that night, she brewed a pot of chamomile tea that was supposed to induce slumber, and they cuddled and chatted on the sofa and tried to get sleepy. Abby said, And you're gone for a week. Something like that. There's no clear agenda because we can't predict what might happen. Lanark has a skeleton crew still at the bridge, and we're told that one of their top engineers will be available. What do you know about bridge construction? She asked with a chuckle. Nothing, but I'm learning. Every case is a new adventure. Right now, I'm the envy of almost every lawyer at Scully. That's a lot of lawyers. It is. And while I'm dashing across the desert in a jeep looking for a magnificent bridge to nowhere, which just happened to cost over a billion dollars, the rest of my colleagues will be stuck behind their desks, worrying about their hourly billing. I've heard this before, and you'll probably hear it again. Well, your timing is good. My mother called today, and they're coming for the weekend. No, my timing is perfect, Mitch thought. In years past, he would have blurted it out and stuck another pin into his wife's skin, but he was in the often uncomfortable process of reconciling with his in-laws. He had come a long way, but back at the beginning there had been so much territory to cover. Anything planned? He asked, to be polite. Not really, 